This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, this is Monday. Aloha from Mina, Marco, and me. <laughs> and today, as you can see, it's not Jay, but it's Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, co-hosting uh, with Mina, Morita also co-hosting, uh, as well as being our guest, as usual. Or, and okay. we have Marco on the Big Island from ProVision Solar. Marco, say hello. Say hello, Marco. Namaste. <laughs> Happy Aloha Monday. <laughs> Welcome and aloha. So uh, today we have an uh, interesting uh, discussion on the International Trade Commission decision last Friday that I'm going to ask Mina to tell us more about and what the implications are of that decision. Mina? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess on Friday there was a huge um, ruling by the U.S. International Trade Commission where um, they voted 4-0 to find cause that the importation of crystalline um, silicon PV modules um, had an unfair import, these imported mod modules had an unfair unfairly disadvantaged two domestic companies. Um, those two companies that filed the, the um, for ruling was Suniva and Solar World. But what I find really interesting is these aren't U.S. companies. These are, um, I, I think, a Chinese company. Is it a Chinese company? Singapore. Oh, Singapore. Singapore and a German company manufacturing in the U.S. But, Marco, I know this um, <coughs> just creates more uncertainty in the uh, solar industry as I think over 90% of panels, modules are imported. So can you give us your take on it? Sure. I mean, the kind of taking a big step back here, as I've uh, been teaching my students in my energy politics class over the years, there ain't no such thing as a level playing field in energy, and there never will be. There's just too much at stake. There's too much money. There's too much uh, in terms of uh, political power and influence that's at stake in the energy arena. So it really comes down to if you buy my premise of the energy field never going to be even, there are going to be some who are going to be supported more than others. And over the past uh, six years now, Solar World, which is based in Germany, has been leading the charge against the importation of cheaper foreign imports coming into the U.S. Uh, they have had a facility in Hillsboro, Oregon, Solar World America, that has been manufacturing product there over the past years. And they, uh, as long as well as others, uh, in this case, Suniva, like you said, Mina, based in Georgia, however, majority owned by a Chinese company by the name of Shunfeng, based in Hong Kong, that uh, the attempt, they've made attempts over the past uh, five, six years to try to penalize uh, uh, in terms of increased uh, duties, import duties and, and tariffs, uh, solar modules coming into the U.S. from outside the U.S. Uh, the, the overall trend line over the past years has been remarkable in terms of the price of PV modules has come down very dramatically. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when I was paying $4 or so per watt uh, for photovoltaic modules, and now uh, the average selling price is probably somewhere in the 40 to 50 cents a watt range, so it's come down by uh, 90 percent or so, 80, 90 percent. So I think, you and, know, uh, uh, sorry, Marco, I, I think um, Department of Energy announced that their sunshot targets were achieved. Um, their, was it their 2020 targets were achieved? Um, in reducing costs, and that was an announcement that just came out recently, like last week too. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think with, um, you know, definitely, you know, that's a great indication yeah. that, that prices were dropping. So I'm sorry, Marco, go ahead, go on. Well, it's, it's become all but impossible for a module 
maker or module assembler, solar module assembler, to make a go of things in the U.S. If you look at a uh, a map of the U.S. that the Solar World prepared and presented to the Commission, the ITC, when there was the public uh, hearings on it a month or so, five, six weeks ago, uh, it was a graphic uh, indication of all the solar assemblers in the United States who had gone out of business over the years. So it's hard to make a case that, that assembling solar modules in the U.S. is uh, sustainably profitable. That said, uh, Solar World and Suniva brought this complaint to the ITC, and the ITC, like you said, Mina, voted for to nothing, uh, essentially supporting Suniva and Solar World's position. What's odd to me is that there are six members of that body, six members of the commission, and I don't know why two of them decided not to vote. But uh, be that as it may, they voted for to nothing in, in favor of the complainants. And then the next step is for them to come up with a, quote, remedy, which there will be another hearing, uh, hearing from the parties on both sides in terms of what such a remedy should look like, the remedy being uh, tariffs placed on uh, solar modules coming from outside the U.S. And then whatever remedy that the ITC decides on will be forwarded to President Trump for his ultimate decision on what to do about the, uh, the, the recommendations of the remedy or remedies that are proposed to him. Interestingly, in the decision from the ITC, they noted that a number of companies, uh, or a number of com a number of countries, uh, in terms of modules possibly produced or, or solar cells produced from these countries, will apparently be outside uh, or, or exempt from any type of, of remedy or tariffs, including places like Australia, Peru, Colombia, and Singapore. So most likely uh, many other countries, Chinese, uh, Chinese mainland, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, and so forth will, will be affected. But apparently some countries, uh, such as REC, which is, uh, I mean, a solar company based in Norway, but they produce solar modules in Singapore. So it would appear, at least at first glance, there will be some, some of these countries that will be spared uh, the the imposition of tariffs. Now, what it's going to mean to us here in Hawaii, both as solar contractors and customers or homeowners and business owners who still want to go with, uh, with installing solar PV, is a likely increase in the overall cost of the system. But none of us are able to be able to foretell what that increase will be because it's still very much uh, uh, the game is still very much afoot. So the actual uh, impacts on us collectively still remain to be seen. But it's certainly unwelcome inform or unwelcome decision on the part of the uh, the ITC's part. And uh, there was a lot of heavy lobby lobbying on both sides, but ultimately the folks at Suniva and Solar World uh, prevailed. So, so Marco, just in terms of process, is there such a thing as an appeal of the decision, or is that a done deal and, you know, it just goes forward? Uh, uh, if you say that there's so many people that are going to—it's going to negatively impact um, having more solar on roofs and, and, and actually getting to our, our goals in, in renewable, sustainable energy for the nation. Uh, is there any way for an appeal from uh, folks who do the installing? That's a great question, Sharon, and I, I'm not enough of an expert on the ITC, the International Trade Commission, to be able to give you a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. uh, there I, could be uh, uh, an appeal kind of on procedural grounds, perhaps, but, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems to me, and I haven't read any analysis uh, even mentioning the possibility of an appeal, mm -hmm. uh, often is the case that the Department of U.S. Department of Commerce will come up with a decision imposing a tariff or some type of fee on imported goods coming into the U.S., and then the ITC actually acts as kind of the court of appeals. But uh, when the ITC essentially fast-tracks the decision like they did with this one, with, in other words, it didn't go to the U.S. Department of Commerce first, but went directly to the ICC. As far as I know, there's no other body above it other than the president uh, mm -hmm. who will make the ultimate decision as to w what degree of remedy is imposed uh, on, on imported uh, or importers of, of solar modules. And one of kind of interesting thing that uh, the complainants asked for was uh, essentially what's referred to as global safeguard protection, global safeguard protection. Well, what does that mean? It's part of the, uh, 
I'm just reading the decision here, Section 202 of the Trade Act of 1974, and that means that these particular parties, Suniva and Solar World, were wanting and asking for protection against the importation of any and all solar modules coming from outside the U.S., whether it's coming from our, our friends in Canada or Mexico or, or anywhere that's outside U.S. territory. And that's, that's about as broad and uh, mm. deep uh, protection as you could possibly ask for. But the Commission decided not to agree to global safeguard protection across the board, but uh, like I said earlier, carve out a number of other of countries in the so-called free trade agreement countries that would likely be exempt from from uh, duties for solar modules coming in from these countries. Mm. So um, I, I guess in today's utility dive, talking about going back to the, uh, the question about process, um, it indicated in that article that um, it, there would have to be a procedural defect in order for the ITC to take up an appeal, mm. that it's nothing of the substance, That's the decision mm. itself, it would have to be procedural. Um, mm. The other thing is, this is such a complex issue, and it's made very a lot of strange bedfellows, like, for example, the Solar Energy Industry Association is aligned with um, Duke Utility and also the Heritage Foundation, mm. and also the mm. ALEC, the American uh, Legislative Exchange Council, which are extremely conservative, conservative. groups. And, and then, I, like I said, mm. the two companies that filed the petition, Suniva and SolarWorld, are, are not U.S. companies or owned by uh, U.S. interests. They're actually, um, you know, foreign companies doing business so could that be a procedural error in a sense that, you know, you're, you're really protecting the interests of the United States, and here you have the, the, the two, I guess you call them petitioners or plaintiffs or whatever you mm. call them, they're the ones coming in who are foreign? I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I mean, oh. <laughs> basically, you know, all they're talking about is domestic uh, manufacturing. So it doesn't matter who does the manufacturing, it's domestic. Hmm. Um, and, 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 and so, yeah, you have these hmm. strange bedfellows. And then, you know, is this playing into um, a president's um, rhetoric of, you know, slapping on tariffs? Uh, uh, you know, that whole thing about importation and, you know, the the, the tariff and, and also the floor price that's being requested by these companies is pretty sizable. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I read, um, Marco, I read that the tariff they're seeking is 40 cents a watt, and the floor price that they're seeking is 78 cents a watt. Hmm. That's what my understanding as well, Mina, that they were seeking a minimum import price of 78 cents a watt. Which, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if the average price uh, right these days is somewhere in the 40 to 50 cents per watt range, that certainly is a I substantial understand. increase in a cents per watt basis for uh, for solar modules. And, and I agree. I mean, the irony of having companies that are uh, completely owned, wholly owned, or, or majority owned by outside companies uh, based in places like Germany and China. Uh, I'm sure that was pointed out in the arguments made by our side, by the Solar Party side, or by the uh, the, the other folks who were opposed to, to Suniva and and mm -hmm. Solar World's complaint. That was uh, made abundantly clear, I'm sure, in their oral and written arguments to the uh, the ITC. But that didn't mm -hmm. didn't apparently hold any sway. Yeah. Or enough way. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest losers in this is the consumer. Yeah, as usual. Seeing increased mm -hmm. prices. So what do you think um, to portend going forward, Marco, uh, if it is double the price uh, that, that the floor is going to be with this decision, what does that mean for the solar industry here in Hawaii and uh, for the consumer? Because we are we can see that higher prices are going to mean less uh, usage uh, and installation, perhaps. 
I think the price per watt, uh, install price per watt of PV systems certainly would be affected uh, and go up with a higher import price uh, or, or import tariff. There's no doubt about that. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, I think uh, those of us in the industry here have uh, just as important, if not bigger, uh, concerns on our minds these days in terms of uh, a tariff uh, or interconnect agreement options that uh, are in flux right now for those homeowners and business owners who still want to go solar who have yet to do so, solar electric. Um, the parties on the distributed energy resources docket or the DUR docket along with the commission are all working hard to try to come up with something in the weeks and months to come as the customer grid supply program sunsets in less than a month from now on October 21st. So in a sense, uh, this decision from last Friday kind of adds insult to injury and the injury being or the injuries being that we're already in a very difficult situation with uh, fewer sales, with fewer interconnect options, with more uh, more and more circuits across the island's utilities. Uh, Eco, Helco, Miko, and KIU you see more and more circuits that are essentially heavily saturated or penetrated by existing rooftop solar. So it's a, it's a combination of a number of things that uh, lead to a very challenging time to be in the solar business. And just kind of FYI, you know, of the top 10 solar electric providers here on this island over the past uh, several years, well, 2015, 2016, uh, the, of those top 10, of which my company is one of them, of the top 10, five of them have either left the island, left the state, dramatically downsized to the point of doing very little solar electric or actually filed for bankruptcy protection. So the attrition rate right now is, is very high uh, and certainly, uh, to me, kind of brings up the broader question of just how valuable is having a viable, healthy solar uh, electric industry here in terms of being able to do rooftop solar, and that's uh, that's a question that uh, you know I have an opinion on, and others do, but it's uh, the kind of the, the rubber hitting the road, so to speak, in terms of where do we collectively go from here with so much in the air, up in the air. Okay, so I, I think the other big news um, that came up last week was um, Solar City resolving with the U.S. Treasury Department it the um, allegation of false. False Claims Act violations, where um, Solar City allegedly submitted in inflated claims on behalf of itself and affiliated investment um, funds to the U.S. Treasury. Um, this has a lot to do with um, uh, ARA grants that um, were allocated in, I think, 2009 and just sunsetted mm -hmm. at the end of December 2016. So apparently, um, mm -hmm. Solar City overstated costs and um, agreed to pay uh, two point, uh, $29.5 million back to the mm -hmm. U.S. Treasury. So uh, any insight on that, Marco? Well, their decision was uh, a while in coming. Mina, I know this investigation has been going on for years. Uh, the Treasury is also investigating other uh, solar finance companies, including Sunrun, if I'm not mistaken, as well. And uh, in terms of number one and number two in the country, uh, Solar City has been number one and Sunrun number two. So uh, I expect another shoe to fall, essentially, with uh, some type of determination regarding Sunrun, uh, perhaps not in the too far distant future, but like you said, the uh, allegation was that Solar World violated the False Claims Act by uh, inflating mm -hmm. the amount of money they said uh, they were claiming uh, in the, the the grant program, the rebate program under Section 1603 of the ARA, uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And interestingly, uh, in reading the press release from the U.S. Department of Justice, this is one of those uh, situations where a uh, large corporation agrees to pony up a substantial amount of money to you and I, $29.5 million, but they explicitly determine or explicitly say that uh, there's no they don't they don't accept any liability in other words they're willing to pay the the money to quote resolve allegations without admitting guilt so i've uh, 
had some feedback from some friends of mine who know this stuff a lot more than I do in terms of the ins and outs of, of uh, these kind of actions. And the belief is that uh, Solar City probably got off quite easy by paying $29.5 million compared to the amount that was alleged uh, by uh, by the investigators uh, in terms of just how much money Solar City made uh, by inflating their uh, their cost to be able to take advantage of this uh, of this uh, rebate program. So the point being is that 29.5 million sounds like a lot of money, but it probably is a very uh, relatively small sum compared to what they were alleged to have profited by uh, inflating. Their their numbers. So I imagine in these in these settlements, they don't actually tell you what they inflated. So it's just a settlement. So it's a wash. Nobody. I mean, is that just sort of none of that information is out to the public to be aware of? You know, I'm, in terms I'm of not sure how, I'm not sure how much of it is public information. I I guess you could get an inkling of the amount for, for on the initial charges what they're charged with. But Marco, how does this affect the um, lease system? So th does it translate to the cost of these le lease systems are also inflated? That's a good question. I mean, I really don't know. I don't see how you know, a lease uh, agreement between Solar City and homeowners is a, uh, is a contract, is a legal contract. I don't see how they could re go back uh, retroactively and say we need to make an adjustment. But again, that's uh, subject to lawyers, and uh, I, don't, uh, you know, I don't have the actual agreements. Uh, I'm not that's privy to them, so I, I really don't know. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting because, again, you know, it, it's a settlement admitting no liability if they had, if they were held um, culpable for these kinds of actions, I, I would think that, um, you know, there would be some recourse in re-examining um, these lease agreements. So, yeah, that would be interesting because, you know, I don't believe we're talking just about utility scale projects, but Mm. Any type of installation mm. um, was eligible for these um, grants. Mm. Well, it would, would be good to know what the claims were then, in fact, if um, customers were really damaged by it. I mean, that they were pay overpaying for systems that they bought as well. Um, yeah, uh, they don't, I don't believe they distinguish between um, these systems or owner-owned systems, just that these systems were installed and they were eligible for these grants. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just looking at the last line of the press release from Treasury uh, on Friday, our Department of Justice, and quote, the claims resolved by the settlement agreement are allegations only, and there has been no determination of liability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, key sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we're getting close to the hour, are we, Rob? So um, I just wanted to um, see whether there was any last words on what it is for the industry, for our consumers, with the decision from the ITC, the International Trade Commission, as well as these kinds of over, um, over, I guess, rated. Uh, um, contracts that that the industry representatives actually do. Is there anything uh, that we can look at from a policy perspective or a consumer beware perspective? What can we tell the listening audience? Oh, there's just a lot of turbulence right now, Fina well, and, uh, and well, I Sharon, think, I think uh, in, in the industry and amongst the, the buying public. and. Uh, a lot of uncertainty, and, mm -hmm. and it's hard to thrive in an environment, in a sales environment that has so many uh, important uh, things up in the air like we're dealing with right now. Nina. I think it's one of the fallouts from exponential growth and then the, the um, industry trying to right itself, and, and then also the challenge of the integration of these kinds of systems um, in, into the grid in general. Um, again, there's still 75% of, of utility customers that are not being 
served mm -hmm. by any type of uh, rooftop system. And, and, and so, you know, the larger question is how do we develop systems where everybody can benefit uh, from, from, um, from renewable systems? So, affordability, so, accessibility. So is there anything a little more positive in the future other than uncertainty, well, I, uncertainty? I, uh, what, what can we kind of work toward um, to uh, reduce the uncertainty, whether on a state level or a county level or industry level or people level? Uh, what could we sort of work on toward that? Oh, I mean, the issues that need to be worked on are really, really tough issues. Um, highly technical and a, a, a lot of cost issues um, in making sure that we have the correct rate designs to incentivize, um, keep incentivizing um, uh, the import from, from these systems or export or exports from these systems to the grid that they're fairly priced and, and again, um, beneficial to the system. And, the and like I mm -hmm. said earlier, these are really technical, complex issues that need to be worked through. But I think one of the things that maybe for the next time, really taking a hard look on um, has has solar uh, rooftop solar contributed to resiliency and mm -hmm. recovering from mm -hmm. these huge disasters in uh, in in Texas, Florida and uh, the Caribbean. That's a really important topic, and I hope that you can cover that. I think we're getting close to the hour, but uh, if you can cover that next time uh, as to how a solar uh, rooftop uh, can, can help us and how might we be more resilient with solar uh, to withstand hurricanes and if, God forbid, And, and now, I mean, I think everybody needs to be you know, uh, looking at Cat 2 storms, but now, I mean, like really, you know, do we need to prepare for Cat 4 and Cat 5 storms? Mm -hmm. So, um, Marco, okay. any closing thoughts? Closing comments. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with you all. This uh, Having battery storage, I think, is a very uh, timely and critical discussion to have, especially in light places like Puerto Rico, which has been hit not by one, but two hurricanes. And I've seen estimates of anywhere between 6 to 12 months before the power grid comes close mm -hmm. to being fully restored, 6 to 12 months. I mean, imagine if that were to be the situation on one of our islands, let alone the whole state. So I think it, um, it, it urges a discussion about whether the time for bat up, battery backup uh, for on an individual basis, in other words, homeowners getting their own Tesla Powerwall or some other comparable product is something that's uh, now or should be considered to be an insurance policy like we pay for the, our home and for our life and our car and our other possessions is an insurance policy uh, to have backup power if the grid goes down or is, is, is hit to be able to, uh, to, to provide that to, to homeowners. So I think that's another pretty interesting discussion that we could have. And do you want to summarize, Nina, uh, today's show and looking forward to next week's show? No, just, you know, I think w w within 72 hours, we, there's, we've created much more uncertainty for uh, the solar uh, sector, not only in Hawaii, but throughout the country. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Marco from the Big Island and Nina. <laughs> Uh, for edifying us and keeping us on track with the, the happenings on the federal level and how it impacts us in Hawaii. So, mahalo, aloha. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks Thank for you. stepping in for Thank today. you very much, guys. Aloha. Always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.